Okay, um, are we going right to Aditi? Is she on? Uh, not or quite she, yet. She comes Just up at 10 after. With, uh, Landry right now. Yeah, let's talk about Jarvis Landry. I thought it was interesting, some of the comments that uh, Nick Chubb and David Njoku had to say yesterday about, about Jarvis Landry. Uh, they miss him. Clearly, they miss yeah. him. I think, I think Chubb's quote was, it would be amazing if he were still here. I thought at the time when they let him get away, and I know that bringing him back at what he was scheduled to make was not a good play. Right. But sometimes this, there's, there's a deal that teams make that you're not paying for the production. You're paying for what he brings to the club. Mm-hmm. And I, I just thought that what Jarvis Landry, the impact that he had on this team and what he meant to this team and especially what he ended up going to New Orleans for. What I did he go for? Was it $8 million? It was, I think it was like six. Was I six? think he was asking for 16 Okay. The, I think maybe the Browns had offered 10 and I think he ended up going to the Saints for eight. Those numbers could be off. Those are just off the top of my head. But what the, what he ended up getting, I thought he would have been a bargain to, to get him here. Jason, I'll ask you this because you've been around this club. They all say he, he, he's the reason the culture changed here. He was the one that guided Nick Chubb through how you handle coming off an 0-16 season. Yeah. They spoke of him like he was walking out mm-hmm. of water. I have immense respect for Jarvis in the way that he competed last year all the way to the end. Even, even though he was the, hurt. Even though he was hurt all the way through the Cincinnati game. Uh, I, the, the, the Baker situation was damaging. Yep. And I didn't think there was any chance he was coming back. And then after the, the Deshaun move, I did think that there was a window there where they could bring him back. I thought maybe there was a possibility. And it just felt to me like Jarvis was ready to move on. And I think the team would have brought him back. I think Jarvis for well, and, one and maybe, point though, didn't he say he would he would like to come back and play in Cleveland? Yeah, but probably at the sixteen million price tag. Yeah, I, I and I don't know that because we were not allowed in the locker room last year, so I haven't had a conversation with Jarvis in a really long time right. about any of this. So I, I don't know, but I just got. I mean, I, the team was open to bringing him back at the right number. Obviously, yeah, they were open to him coming back. You just after wonder the how Baker things would be made. different this year. You really well, he's do. not the same player. He hasn't no, had the same year. I looked, I mean, so he's had nine, he's only played nine games. So he's, he's missed a lot to injury. But his 25 catches in 272 yards, he has more production than Bell and Schwartz combined. Yeah. Oh, there would have been a place for him, but I'm just saying he's not the Jarvis that when, you that probably we, expect. When we got. Yeah. When yeah. Got his best game was, I think, the first game. He had a great first game back in New Orleans. And then after that, it's just sort of been downhill ever since yeah. all year long. Well, he was he was, but he was special. He was special in the to, in the locker to, room. Yeah, hundred percent true. Sure. He was one of the leaders for sure. And the you know fans really liked him too. Uh, he was like a very yeah. so it'll be interesting. I mean, he's not like I don't know who's even going to be at this game uh, on Saturday necessarily. Like how many fans are going to be there, or if they well, will there'll be, be at least. Four, because Jason's taking his side, right. taking mine. Yeah. Or if they will be the real fans, or if these are people like this is a chance for people who just might want to check out a product, or I don't know. I, I mean, like their their tickets going for four bucks right now, guys. I online. know they are. So yeah. not great. So they can be had cheap. Yep. Aditi, um, welcome to the program. When when you look at what a player like Jarvis means to a team, um, do, do you think that it was a mistake for the Browns to not bring him back, even if it wasn't for his production, just for? his rub off factor, particularly after hearing Chubb and Njoku just sing his praises about what he meant to that locker room. I don't, I, you know, I don't need to hear them say it. I lived it. I was I there. It. I when Hugh Jackson wasn't making guys work and Jarvis Landry was saying, no, working is the only way that you get anywhere. And Jason, I love you. But when you say that he's not the same player, who cares? You don't, the way that you construct a team is not the 53 most talented guys at each Absolutely. position. Yes, it's yeah, a I chemistry agree. experience. And you sometimes need a little dash of this and a little pinch of that to really get the most out of any locker room. And what we heard Nick Chubb say, what we heard these guys talk about, is how Jarvis Landry infused a level of professionalism And you know what? I get the opportunity to talk to Dennis Allen, to talk to Pete Carmichael, to talk to the Saints about that. And even though Jarvis has been hurt and hasn't been able to contribute as much on the field as perhaps they had hoped and hoped to get out of him in the future, they were unequivocal in talking about how he's the one that kind of 
leads the quarterbacks and the receivers, and he's the one that sets the tone, despite the fact that he is somewhat diminished because of the injury. And then, gosh, you talk about reliability. I mean, this is a guy that put his body on the line every day, every play, every snap. That's something that you just can't, you can't say that to someone. You have to show it to someone. You have to play next to somebody who does that. And yeah, I mean, personally, you can hear the the pain, the passion, the hurt in my voice because you, I felt that this was such a key, 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 important piece of what the Browns were able to do over the last few years. And, and let's be fair, both Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski acknowledged that. And even though there had to be sort of this separation, Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Barry did not mince words in talking about how important Jarvis Landry was to their growth as an organization and to, as we keep saying, the setting of a culture of that organization. I'll tell you this. I always thought that I had a great relationship with Jarvis, even when things were very tough with Odell Beckham and whether he was the right fit for this particular offense. I've asked to talk to Jarvis this week. You know, if I call him myself, I know he's not going to pick up because he's just not like that. So I formally asked. I don't know if he's going to talk to me. I'm sure I'll talk to him on the field Saturday morning. I look forward to it. But I really, really, really hope I get the opportunity to talk to him during the week just to, you know, He's got some remove now. He's got a little bit of space to step back and to hear his teammates, his former teammates, say what they say. That has to mean something to him. I hope that means something to him. Didi, do you think he wanted to move on? Do you think he was ready to move on? Because I know the organization was no. open to bringing him back. So where yeah, did it no, fall I, apart? I think that he would have come back. At, I, I, think, I do think that he would have come back. I do. And I think that there was probably some excitement about the opportunity to play with Deshaun Watson as well. I do. You know, you never know though, right? Because you hear often from both sides, oh, we tried to make it work and he didn't want to, or we tried to make it work and they didn't want to. I don't know. But in my heart of hearts, I do think that there was some middle ground to be met. What did he sign in New Orleans? You know this. We've seen this across the league a gazillion times. I mean, I remember I remember a gazillion years ago when James Harrison ultimately signed for less with the Cincinnati Bengals than the Pittsburgh Steelers would have given him, but it was about ego. And it was, mm-hmm. how dare you, after this many years and how much I've meant to this club, you offer me X amount of money, and then he went for less money. So it's not even just about the money sometimes. Sometimes it's about the respect factor, the way that you feel you're being spoken to. And, I mean, ego's always involved. When, you, right. when you're as passionate as a player like Jarvis Landry is, as a player like James Harrison is, as a person like I am, then of course, ego and the way that you feel you're being treated and how you're appreciated and how you're being valued, that of course comes into play. Well, he signed for one year, six million. Who knows? Maybe he comes back. I, I Maybe. Wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that. I wouldn't mind that at all. And yeah. I, don't know. I think I if the Browns know, had exactly a mulligan to whether. do this over. <laughs> calling card Mike when you say that tickets are available for four dollars all I have to say is people better be in the stands because if I am there on the field <laughs> suffering through all of that yeah. okay and as much as we've talked about how I need to get in better shape there's not a lot of fat on this body and I'm yeah. going to be out there on yeah. the field and I don't get to run around you know so somebody come out there and feel my Jay and I will be please. there. Jay and I are taking our kids. Well, I'm sitting in the club seats though because we're going inside when it gets cold. <laughs> now, 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 Didi, you, guys you are work all so privileged. <laughs> my goodness, so privileged. you you work on the sidelines, so <coughs> obviously you have to go to the game. But what under what circumstances and what would the temperature have to be if you were going to a regular game? like as a family, as a civilian. Is there a temperature that you ain't going below? Like if it's 26, uh, I'm not going to watch no game. 26, it's supposed to be like minus nine wind chill with 50 mile per hour winds. 26 sounds positively balmy, I'd take that. (laughs) Um, I'm the wrong, you know what, Gia, I'll be honest with you, I'm the wrong person to ask because it's hard for me. I admire you, Jason, I admire you, Jay. It's like a busman's holiday. When you're used to being on the field and being in the thick of the action, yeah. it's really hard to just sit in the stands. Yeah. And I haven't been able to properly really do it. I, I've tried with my son a couple times in at college games. It's easier for me to watch on TV with my son mm. um, because then at least I'm like so far removed, I can't be jumping over people to get on the field. But I'm <laughs> a little bit afraid that at some point 
you know, I'll be in the stands and say, what? And all of a sudden be leapfrogging and working onto the field. And I'll be one of those people you see security tackling. How do you see this game playing out? I mean, it's it, it, the Saints have a, a little bit clearer path to the playoffs. The Browns obviously are an extreme long shot. Um, what, what do you think happens? I like the urgency with which the Browns are playing right now. I do, quite frankly. I think that um, you're right, despite that ugly, ugly, ugly record that the Saints have. You've got Andy Dalton, who's won the fourth most games of any quarterback in Cleveland. How crazy is that, right? Wow, Harry thanks Bradford. for that little stat. What a little pick-me-up. <laughs> Thank you, Aditi. Yeah. <laughs> that is such – Andy is, Dalton is 12-5. Oh. and five. I just mean, you know, as an opposing quarterback. So Andy Dalton is 12-5 and five in Cleveland. He knows those wins, and I actually talked to him about that. You know, the part of going to an away environment, and we know this all throughout the AFC North, is that these stadiums are tough, and they are all on water. All four AFC North stadiums are on water. There is weird wind involved in everything that's going on. It's not just about the cold. Andy's familiar with it. Andy knows where the pockets are that they swirl and where they come off the seats and where they don't. So I think that that's all good. And Andy Dalton, too, is having a great year, even though he's not getting as much help. Um, But I'm curious about Nick Chubb's health. That obviously always, you know, uh, something to pay attention to. I think that I really like the way the Browns defense has played the last month. I like the sense of urgency that they're playing with. I like that they seem to be playing a little bit freer, a little bit faster. That may be because, as they've talked about, Joe Woods has kind of slimmed down the play menu and just said, you know what, we just need to do what we do really well, really, really, really well, and that's that. Um, I like that. And I also think that, you know, they know that they're not out of it meaning the Browns, they know that they're not out of it. The the AFC North is really very much, and I said this this morning, just get in the dance. It's about who's going to get hot. We saw the Chiefs almost lose to the Texans, who, by the way, have one win and are a team, uh, I mean, just are lacking in a full team of talent. There are young, talented players, but that's not a full team by any means. And yet the Texans nearly and should have upended the Chiefs. We've seen the Bills look vulnerable. I don't think that anybody is just running away every single Sunday with the AFC. So it's this feeling of, okay, just get in. And now look, the the Ravens, I mean, how long is Lamar Jackson out for? Is there potentially some way to back into the playoffs? And And we know this. Wild card teams have won the Super Bowl. So I think if the Browns are feeling good about themselves, if they're bringing themselves some urgency, if they feel that this insane weather day is a boon to them going against a dome team, which they absolutely better feel that way about it, if playing on Christmas Eve in front of Jason Lloyd and Jay Crawford's sons <laughs> isn't incentive and motivation, come on. Yeah, and I mean, if that isn't motivation, you're not alive. Away- children in the blizzard conditions <laughs> potentially being blown away then i mean come on <laughs> if i could suck it up suck it up buttercup right <laughs> there you go yeah I, it's gonna be it, it will be brutal i've been there for those though i know these games well like being these home games i've spent i had season tickets for a long time I, those were pa- those tickets were passed down to me like a burden by my father when he <laughs> uh, no, curse? yeah he yeah. no longer wanted <laughs> to deal with that and then eventually yeah, I, I, you do realize, right, that it's way worse on the field than it is in the stands. First oh, of all, absolutely. in the stands, you have people buffering you. Yeah, 100%. You've got walls of the section. On the field, it's just all... Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. Kills you. Was like, I, don't want any, I don't want to look down the sideline and see anyone looking like a Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. And I'm like, <laughs> hello, that's exactly what I will be looking like. Thank you very much. Can, <laughs> you, can you sit on the bench? The players have been talking a week about how warm and cozy it is on the bench. Can you just slide up next to them and sit on their bench for a few minutes and defrost? <laughs> You know what's so funny is Jay Feely said that he used to just sit on the bench all the time. I was like, well, you probably blend it in. Yeah. yeah. I'm sitting on Bench. Although I did tell Greg Newsom I might be doing that. I said, <laughs> if you see like, a random little person on the end of your bench, it's probably me. You how many, how, me how many <laughs> layers are we doing, Aditi? What do you, how do you layer up for something like this? I know. So I think there are long johns. There's an Under Armour turtleneck. There's another Under Armour warm thing. There's a coat. I need, I can't get a heated vest. I can't, 
I tried to order a heated vest and I can't get one in time. I went to three different sporting goods stores here in town, could not get one. Thanks, so Biden. I think I'm going to have <laughs> mega warmers and, you know, like medical tape them to my body. <laughs> <laughs> The things that I'm most concerned about are my fingers and my toes. Yeah, because yeah, that's where it all fingers, starts. Yeah. Do you know and Sarah so I Walsh, think I just, Aditi? I do know Sarah Walsh. Okay, of course, yes. Sarah, Sarah's awesome. Um, reach out to Sarah and see if there's any way she can next. She covers the Buccaneers. She, uh, see if there's any way she can next day you a vest so you can have it by Saturday. Tell her. Tell you her do that know I, that you. Now that Sarah Walsh bundles up when it's 55 degrees, Listen, right? Like she's 55 cold. degrees and freezing. She's from Tampa. So whenever it's anything over <laughs> uh, colder than 60, she shivers, <laughs> physically shakes. <laughs> so ask, ask Sarah for that awesome heated vest she has. She's not going to need it. You are. And tell her that I, I said to do the right thing, Sarah. Do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. This is the trouble. There are things to order. It's just getting them here. I mean, the holiday makes it that difficult. I know. So I know. I ask the phenomenal, amazing Brad Mellon, who, of course, is the Browns' tremendous equipment manager, if there's any way he can pull me out an extra heater so I'm not, like, fighting the punters and the kickers who are generally always hovering <laughs> over there. Soft punters. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I, if anybody's got suggestions on what I could possibly butter Brad up with to uh, convince him that I would like one of those, I'd appreciate it. Now, because you're part of the broadcast, I know that we can't ask you um, what's going to happen, who you think's going to win. I get that. Um, just tell us what kind of a game we should expect, because I think in general, we're thinking it's the lowest under that any of us can ever remember seeing. I think it's at 31 and a half right now. I've never seen anything. I can't remember anything being below 34. Uh, so the experts in Vegas think that this is going to be maybe a 17 to 10. Is there any scenario that you can envision where it's they're just dead wrong and we end up getting a high scoring game? Yeah, if like the weather changes completely. <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know. You know how crazy the wind is and how unpredictable it is. I mean, something as simple as kicking field goals becomes a crazy adventure if it's nuts like that. We were, and again, I said we were talking to Andy Dalton earlier about this, and he was saying if it would snow, it would be better than if there's any other sort of precipitation because at least that makes the ball a little tackier. Mm. But it's not going to snow if it's minus 9 degrees. It'll be too cold for it to snow. You know, so it's... I think there's a little bit of fear of throwing the ball when the wind is so unpredictable. And this is the stadium where the wind is the most unpredictable in the entire National Football League. I think that the, oh gosh, why are you showing me this? <laughs> this is one of, oh, it's funny because my producer, my producer was telling me, he started telling me on Sunday, I think, last Sunday or last Saturday, he's like, so here's what I need you to do. Go stand outside for four hours every day. <laughs> You'll not do it. Time to get your tolerance up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Seriously. And I was like, I don't know if this is better to just rip off the Band-Aid because there really is no preparation for any of that. But uh, I think that um, – I do think it will be low scoring. I think that it benefit. I think both teams would like to play that way, quite frankly. I think both teams would like to play – grind it out football. I can tell you that the sideline reporter would certainly like a moving clock. Like a constant <laughs> You want no the game to be over by three o'clock. Extensive replays. Let's just move that ball and move that <laughs> clock for sure. Aditi, based on where we're at in the season, we were talking a little bit about this earlier. And just assuming Nick Chubb is he was on the injury report this week, but assuming he's totally good to go, do you think that he will, based on the game situation and the weather and everything, uh, and where our cha playoff chances are at, do you think he's going to get more touches in this game than he typically gets or fewer touches? I never know, but I hope more. I mean, I like more. I like I like the idea of more. You know, I, it, it's funny. I, um, I do a radio show here in Pittsburgh, and um, Mel Blunt, who, of course, is in the Hall of Fame, who is a cornerback unlike any cornerback has ever been built, um, 
was talking about Franco Harris. This was the day before, unfortunately, I mean, tragically, Franco Harris passed away. And part of that is because Franco Harris's number is being retired this weekend. This is, of course, the 50th anniversary of the Immaculate Reception. I know Browns fans hate that moment just as much as Raiders fans do. But one of the things that I'm bringing up here, the reason I'm bringing this up is that Mel Blunt said that old school football used to all be about the running back. You went the way the running back went. It was the running back who had 30 or 35 touches and the quarterback maybe threw the ball 10 times a game. And when we were talking yesterday with Tyron Matthew about Nick Chubb, he said, man, he's just an old school dude. Yeah, And he said in the way that he runs, in the way that he behaves, I mean, the guy never trash talks on the field. Tyron even brought that up. And so the way that Mel Blunt is talking about Franco Harris carried those teams, that those teams were about the running back, not the quarterback, not the receiver, not anybody else. It was about the running back. That really is who Nick Chubb is. And it feels like this time of year, this day, these two teams, this weather, it calls for nothing but old school running back play. And who here, is that? Here. But um, so, it, and we know Nick Chubb can handle it. If Kevin Stefanski wants to give him 30 to 35 touches, I'm sure he'll say, all right, hit me one more time. And again, like I said, the sideline reporter would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't run out of bounds. <laughs> yeah. Aditi, you mentioned the- <laughs> on every single one of those runs. Please, please, please. When you're talking about the immaculate reception play, I, I put it in our group chat with these guys. I went back and like watched it, obviously, like everybody else did, but I really watched it and it cracked me up. Like, first of all, they're, the running backs are in three point stances in the backfield. It's the last play yeah. of the game. <laughs> they, Bradshaw held the ball for like five or six seconds. They only made it to the 30. It's the last play <laughs> of the game. I'm spinning everywhere. He threw it to the 30 yard line. Like, how does this foot like the game? Then the best to play today, of all time. It's hysterical. Like, today, <laughs> right, you got the ball in the 40. Right. You're going to throw it to the end zone. They threw it to the – he was still 30 yards short even if he catches the ball. And we worship him. How does this happen? Different, Crazy. Different game. Different game. Well, different. I wondered, though, did they have a timeout? Because when he scored, there was five seconds left. So – and and obviously, the, the Kareem, you know, the, the Karam. That's actually a good point. So, I mean, if, I they, keep, if they had I just a time, assume it's the last yeah, play of the game, but you're it, right. It there was wasn't. I think they did have a timeout. They were hoping to get close enough to do the Hail Mary, yeah. which would have been from the 30 or whatever. Aditi, um, we can't let you go. You bring up Franco Harris. I, I'm, I'm assuming you met him at some point. Um, I would love to hear you just talk a little bit about the man that was Franco Harris. Aside from the football player, I had a chance to meet him. He was just, he was just overwhelmingly friendly. I'm wondering your experiences with Franco. Same, 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 same. I, I've never. I, I said this earlier in the week, and I, I'm still struggling to think of. Any man, forget his legendary stature, just any man of any stature who was as approachable, as mm -hmm. genial, as fun-loving, as ready. I've never seen him say no to anyone for a photo or an autograph. We had him on our podcast, our Hall of Fame podcast this summer. We sat with him and Fred Veletnikoff for an hour. Oh, wow. And then later in the day, for 20 minutes, we're sitting and we're talking and we were talking about my kids. And we're talking about Pittsburgh and transplanting and a little bit about Penn State. I mean, he was as approachable as could be, as humble as could be. The most emotion in his voice is talking about his Italian mother and food and the Ave Maria and things like that more than it was about anything he ever did on a field. But on the field, he really, truly... And I'm saying this from having had so many conversations with men like Joe Green, men like Mel Blunt. He is the one that really made the Steelers believe that they could win. He is really the one that changed fortunes. And that play was his rookie year. He was yeah. a tremendous, 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 tremendous football player beyond just that play. And it was Fred sure. Belenikoff who still harbors 50 years later, all this anger about that play and believes it's not a catch and insists it's not a catch. But he spoke most eloquently on our podcast that was honoring the 50, the Immaculate Reception about how Franco was so much more 
than just that one play. And sometimes that goes over shattered. But here's the one piece, and I'll tell you that this actually comes from my husband. I said this on the radio yesterday, and then shortly afterwards, I heard Mike Tomlin say the same thing. He so willingly and openly carried the responsibility of being the face of that Steelers team. Mm -hmm. That was an organization, and, and I do need to go because Deshaun Watson's about to talk to us, but really quickly, Art Rooney, the chief, the owner of the Steelers, missed that entire play because he was oh, in the God. elevator. Yeah. He was sure that his Steelers were once again going to lose, once again going to go wow. down. He got himself into an elevator, missed the entire immaculate reception. That elevator panel, by the way, sits and in the Pro Football it. Hall of Fame because it's such a crazy story that he missed the play. It was expected that the Steelers would lose. It was expected that the Steelers were a hapless bunch. Franco comes in, and yes, there were an absurd number of Hall of Famers on that team. There was Joe Green, there was Lynn Swan, there was Jack Lambert, Jack Ham, all of these guys. Terry Bradshaw. Chuck Knoll, yes, all of these guys, Terry Bradshaw. But it was Franco that everybody says changed things. And it's Franco who for the ensuing 50 years was available whenever, wherever the Steelers needed him to carry the banner of that club, of that organization. Right. He willingly did it. He never seemed put out by any of it. And just on a personal, humble level, I mean, he had time for everybody, 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 everybody. Mel Blunt said it this week. He said he's never met a more decent human than Franco Harris. Yeah. And Mel Blunt has run two youth homes for kids that need help. And he's saying that Franco is the best guy he ever met. Yeah, it really, it's just, it, it's, 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 it, it, it saddens me. It's tragic. It is tragic. That finally he was getting his due, that he was going to become only the third number ever retired in the city of Pittsburgh, that there are these massive celebrations planned for him. And this is what happened just a few days shy of that. The tragic is the right word yeah. for sure. Um, that play launched the Steelers dynasty. It was voted number the number one play in the history of the NFL, and um, his his absence is is going to be felt certainly by by Pittsburgh and the entire NFL community. Aditi, go tell Deshaun what's up. Yeah. Uh, G. Yeah, Bush, G, G. Bush loves the Kool Aid. You know he's drinking it. He believes in him. And um, stay warm. Um, we'll see you Saturday at the stadium. <laughs> 